Again, I sort of want to say to people, if they're starting a spiritual journey, just understand that your software is also going through a big upgrade. You know, your software is going through this big, like long upgrade system. And there will be times, a number of times that you will be faced with your inner critic going, oh, no, 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 let's just stay as we are. Or don't go out today. Or no, don't sign up for that class. Or no one will like you. Or I know they talked about, about that, but you're different. It won't happen to you. Or, oh, no, just stay in. It's safer. Or don't, don't send that email. Or don't put yourself out there. Or don't go on that dating website, whatever it might be that someone wants to do, your inner critic is always going to step in because it's desperately trying to keep you safe. And the only way it knows how is by keeping you in your comfort zone. Hey, welcome back to Soul Awakenings with Madhya Sosan podcast. And today we have Anneli Howlin. Anneli is a highly qualified performance coach with over 20 years of experience working with leaders in business, athlete, sports persons, and members of armed forces, including ex UK Special Forces. She specializes in transitional support and through her unique approach, can ensure her clients overcome any self-imposed limitation to achieve their goals and move forward with confidence and live a more fulfilling life. Now, there's so much more to this amazing woman. I'm super excited to interview her. Let's bring her on. Hi, Anneli. How are you doing? How are you really doing? Uh, I'm great. Thank you so much for asking me. And how am I really doing? As you you know, one of my favorite questions. So how am I really doing? It's Friday when we're speaking, end of a week. Um, a lot's been happening, a lot of really exciting sort of new. I'm feeling a lot of new. And it's the end of April when we're talking. So I know podcasts are evergreen. People might listen to this at any point, but it's the end of April. And uh, yeah, I'm really getting that springy feeling of like all the shoots of things that I've planted and conversations I've been having, like things seem to finally be kind of coming out of the ground. So that's really exciting. But also, honestly, my energy is a bit down because because of like, <laughs> you know, like it's it's really brilliant stuff, but you need the energy to go into that. And then life and responsibilities and that sort of stuff on top of it but um yeah um, I would say this is a happy Friday that we're speaking on oh amazing amazing I always like um when I was listening to you, some of your interviews and they always start off with how you're really feeling and it just kind of reminds me because when I give talks I I always ask how are you really feeling and it's so important to tap into uh, the deep end straight away is like in our society people in society they don't really talk about what, how they're really feeling I'm feeling like um, I'm like feeling sad but I'm also feeling really energetic at the mm. same time and it's like you know uh, it's 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 so uh, difficult to uh, sometimes feel when you're trying to suppress your feelings definitely I, I wrote um, so I have like a, a mindset memos newsletter that goes on Things. And I wrote one, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, about when we do feel two things, <coughs> excuse me, two things at once. And I, I, so my daughter's six, nearly set, six and three quarters. So very important. Whenever we go anywhere, she, I have to say <laughs> three quarters. Um, but I, when we were sort of starting to talk about feelings and different things, I said, look, you know, sometimes you feel two things at once. And I called it happy, sad. Mm. You know, I sort of explained it like you've got the beautiful backdrop. And I've just been on holiday with her. We had the most amazing vacation together in the Caribbean. So I'm having all sorts of feelings right now with your palm tree. And I said, you know, it's like you've been on a beautiful holiday and you've enjoyed it so much. It's been so good that you're kind of sad it's coming to an end. But it's a happy sad because it means you had such a great time. You know, mm. or sometimes you'll see me crying because I'm so happy, you know, for her. Or she said something so beautiful or, um, I, you know, I've, I'm watching her doing something and, and she'll see me cry. And I'm like, no, I'm ha it's happy sadness. I'm, and maybe I'm thinking about, you know, her being little and how much bigger she's got. So, yeah, I love that you've said that because so often we are feeling more more than one thing. And, yeah, I always open with how are you feeling and you can't say good, fine or OK. That's the caveat. And that's so like surface, you know, we're like, yeah, yeah, how are you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How are you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, well, none of us know anything at all from that answer like I don't know anything that's going on with you I don't know how you're feeling I've just probably done a really good job of hiding how I'm mm. feeling that, like, choo, 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 you know like quickly just just don't ask me anymore don't linger there because actually right now I can't talk about it like a lot of the time when I do it especially when I do talks online I have cameras 
going off. It's like a uh, blockbuster, like do, 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 do. <laughs> the screens just go off because, and then I get messages either during on chat or after just saying, I'm so sorry, I couldn't keep the camera on because I was so upset. Mm. And that's simply from being, looking and taking a moment and a pause to think about how you are feeling. Mm. And we just don't as a society do that. And I think it's because a lot of the time we're kind of existing you know one of my strap lines is stop existing start living and I think that we're so in like fight or flight or the grind or the ego or call it whatever you will I'm sure we're going to get into all of it but we're so in that that we're not even able to stop or prepared to for what we might see and what we might see inside and how we're really feeling so I'm super excited and I've got a lot of energy out at the moment but I know myself and there's a warning light just beginning to flicker on my dashboard which is I need to pull back Mm -hmm. so this weekend I've got quite a nice weekend it's me and my daughter and just going to do some quite low-key things and make sure I get plenty of rest and renewal and then I will be okay but right now I can tell that if I was to carry on pushing from this place I would not be so yeah, it's such an amazing way to open up. And I think it just creates real genuine connection as well. Yeah. And I, I often do find that um, some of the times when I'm um, like feeling down and I, I express it and if I express it more than one, like more, more often and often the feedback is, well, you're just negative. Yeah. <laughs> You're just like, no, I'm just telling you how I'm really feeling. <laughs> you honestly, how I am. Oh, it's interesting. <laughs> I think as well, some people, I mean, I'm very optimistic. I am a very, po- I'm, I can border on toxic positivity. So yeah. <laughs> oh, no, it's not bad. Look, this could be happening. You've lost your job, but hey, the next one's coming. And I do live my life like that. And we were talking off air about, you know, what's meant for you and higher purpose and trying not to interfere. But Yeah, I think that there's, you've got to hold space if someone's, and be able to do that. That's why I think, I don't think most people are inherently bad or don't want to listen or don't want to lend an ear. Honestly, I think it's twofold. I think it's one, we don't feel that we have the tools to support people if they're not good, fine or okay. It's like, like, yes. Sorry, I'm going to swear. Shit, I don't know what to do. Like, if, if you say that you're not good, fine or okay, like, I don't think I can deal with your emotions. I might get it wrong. I'm not, just I might get it wrong and also I think most of the time people are also teetering on this brink of something themselves and by you bringing your emotion or or naming negative things I'm gonna have to look into myself here and I'm not ready to do that like I'm not ready for Pandora's box to be opened I'm not ready to go into my emotional vulnerability right now so by me keeping it yeah good fine okay Mm. and at this level and pushing it away that's my band-aid that I'm using right now so I think a lot of the time if people listening are experiencing that and maybe with friends they're like why are people not helping me or giving me the space to process I think a lot of the time we just can't and also we're afraid of what of what that might open up for us and we're just not able maybe in that moment to go there Mm. I mean um like this all goes down to healing work as well because you know I um I had my spiritual awakening um, seven years ago, six years ago. And prior to that, I used to suffer from extreme anxiety to a point I could not even leave the house. So that was my life for 10 years, right? So going from there, now I had a lot of trauma that I had to deal with. So past seven years is working on it, processing, healing, working on it, processing, healing. And a lot of people in my life had to fall off because they were in the same vibration where I was. Um, And... I guess like the the negative aspects is they like you said they don't know how to deal with it but you're also in the midst of your healing process mm. you know what would you say to our audience audiences who are going through uh, a spiritual awakening or they are going through like okay yeah I want to do this work now but their friendships are falling apart like left right and center what would you say to them it's so hard and I just want to sort of hold some space for that I also just want to say like firstly that's an incredible story and journey and I love that you're doing this now and I I hope it's giving hope I hope our conversation is giving some hope because there are going to be people listening who are you seven or eight years ago who haven't left the house yeah. and when they hear they've got seven years of work like if I'd come to you and you're still in that in that difficult phase gripped by your anxiety and I said listen you can get out of it but it's going to take you seven years of work I mean, you'd probably be like, I haven't got it in me. Yeah. Do it. So I just want to sort of say to people listening that although, and I've been on, I've had my own spiritual awakening and been doing this probably for close on to 15, 20 years now, you know, so, but it's not, 
all at once. And every time you just need to take a step on a path and then the next one will show itself to you. Like you don't, it's not sort of, oh, here's seven years of work to sign up for and you need all of your energy like that. It, it's a gradual process. Sometimes things are very quick. We were talking off air about people that can drop away in an instant and that does happen and it can feel very jarring it can and it can bring up when you're processing and healing work what's wrong with me why did they not want to be friends with me why don't they like me and then also maybe how was I so stupid to trust them how could I have been taken in like that how could I not see what they were really like and that is shame that's me using sort of shame language there so I just want to sort of put that into the the people listening that if you're feeling those things The very fact that I've said it and you've said it, it's normal. You know, we're two people talking today. We haven't planned our conversation as such off air. You know, so this is something that the collective and a huge amount of people are going through. And the other thing I want to say is when I found myself in these positions, and I'd actually love to hear from you what you did as well. Because I think people can go, yeah, I I think that's me now. I'm seeing friendship shifting. I'm not feeling like I belong in the same groups, communities, uh, systems that I was in before that suited me before. But what do I do? And you just start somewhere. So, I mean, I would go on to courses, you know, I'd sign up for something I hadn't been to before. And for me, that was a bold step, you know, to go alone to something and then you'd meet people there. And maybe you make one friend there that's obviously sharing an interest in something that you're doing, whether it's a hobby or, you know, you might be signing up for a walking group or a gong bath or or whatever it might be. And then you start meeting your, your group, your tribe and meeting you on that vibration as well. And I went to a beautiful gong bath in January, near me in South West London. And uh, there was the most, she's the most terrific teacher. She's wonderful. And one of the ladies there sort of shared early on and said, I don't really know what to do, but I know that I need to change a lot of things in my life and a lot of people. I didn't know where to start. And honestly, this is my first step. And the whole room, you just felt this connection, this compassion. And the teacher is extraordinary. She said, right, three people, we put your hands up that are happy to connect after this and continue this conversation. And there was more than three, you know? So I just want to say that to people listening because there there are those moments when you just don't think you can get out of bed. I remember meeting another lady at that same event and she was so, I'd noticed earlier, maybe the trauma therapist in me, I noticed that she was being walked to the door of this very nice hotel is where it was hosted by husband, partner, didn't know who. And I thought, oh, that's interesting, because it wasn't like, see you later, it was a UK. And anyway, then we ended up being sort of paired in a smaller group and talking. And she said it was one of the first times she'd left the house because she was so wrapped with grief over the death of a parent and she tried absolutely everything. And he had literally had to walk her to the door. Yeah, and he was walking her back. And I made a point of giving her my phone number at the end as well, because whether, whether she wanted to reach out and connect or not, it was just being seen. And she was so grateful she was so grateful, um, you know, just for that that point of connection and she was trying anything. So I think I just want to say to people, wherever you are, you're not alone, even though it might feel like that. And you are always being guided towards something good for you, whether you're spiritual or not. You know if it feels good or not. You know if it feels like a good fit for you or not. You can do it simply on energy because our brains get very overactive, right? They're like, oh, but I've known them since I was at school. Or, oh, but, you know, we're on a group WhatsApp. Or, oh, but we've got this booked. Or, oh, but, you know, there's all these reasons, these rational reasons. But fundamentally, when you've been around these individuals, do you come away feeling better, like more energized or much worse? And Mm. honestly, we ain't got time to waste. Like that is that is the best test, I would say, of all. If, If you need to just always go into your body, always check back in with your body and it will give you the wisdom that perhaps your, you know, your little inner critic in there is is interfering with. And just know that there are so many places where there is connection waiting for you, real heart centered connection, and they want to hold you in that space. And every step of my journey, you know, some of them have been complete surprises, but change has always delivered me to a much better place than I, I was at before. And a much more authentic version of myself as well. Oh, wow. Uh, you know, the story that you just shared about this lady, it, mm. I could just, I, I could see myself in it because um, when I was, um, obviously my my dad passed away when I was 13, so I'm 34 now. So six months after my mom fell ill, so I became her carer. 
and then it just went on like I was just suffering and I used to have community befrienders and come take me even to my garden because that's how bad it was you know and I just did not like the grief I didn't grieve the loss of my dad I didn't grieve the loss of my um my young years because like I was 14 when I started caring for my mom um mm. and it's just when the spiritual awakening happened I didn't, I didn't, um, I, I was doing 50% of the work. So I was going out into the world and doing like, it was almost like I had an out of body experience. I was an atheist, didn't believe in anything, out of body experience, bang, bang. And before I know it, from a person who couldn't leave the house, not being able to leave the house to doing everything. But there was one thing that I was doing was that was different rather than seeing a lot of people or uh, helicopterized because I'm living the life again, you know, kind of thing. But one thing I was doing was actually for two years, I sat with myself and asked myself two questions. That was, how are you feeling? Are you really okay? And that was the questions I was asking. And when I was asking them, all of my trauma for the past 15, 16 years were coming up. And it was like, it was like guided. It was like my spirit. When you're really high spiritually awakening, your guide, you can feel your guides around you, right? And that's when... I kept going. There was times when I was rolling on the floor, crying, and then getting up and playing badminton because that's how normally it became, just releasing and purging it out your system, your body. And like, I really wanted to like, um, I really want to say like how important it is to just sit with your emotions. Mm. In our society, like you said, it's go, go, go all the time. Um, and just sitting, finding at least 10 minutes or 15 minutes a day where you 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 have no distractions and you just being with it and you you can feel the emotion like you can literally feel the emotion moving out of your body um and emotions are like the weather like looking at your beautiful sort of screens behind you and you know emotions will come and go but we're so afraid of allowing them and I'm not you know I'm not belittling it I know that you're not people are genuinely really afraid and they've locked things away and parts of themselves mm -hmm. for so long there probably will be a bit of a cascade to start with mm -hmm. but like any weather that would be a storm that needs to break so there would be a huge amount maybe initially and then the sky clears and we all breathe a bit easier and then there'll be you know different weather patterns but I mean thank you so much for sharing that and I think again for people listening I love what you said about grieving what you'd lost like your younger years and I was listening to an interview with Simon Sinek and Stephen Bartlett the diary of a CEO and Simon Sinek is an extraordinary about loneliness if anyone has not listened to it I couldn't recommend it highly enough and Simon Sinek has been a late diagnosis ADHD and he was talking about how he now has understood his diagnosis and what that means for why he hasn't been able to have a romantic relationship long term and hasn't had children and you know, sort of finds himself late 40s and hasn't fulfilled these. And he just said, I'm feeling lonely because I'm mourning and grieving the loss of what could have been. And I think it's so important that we don't step over that because that's, you know, you, everything that you'd been through and needing to grieve what you had missed out on. You know, at 14, it's very unusual to be having that level of responsibility that you had and the grief for your father as well, you know, and all of these things, as well as, going through schooling and being normal in the worst time yeah. to try and fit in. I mean, my goodness, bless you. You know, so you're going through all of these things and, and you, we do need to grieve things before we, as well as people, there's a, there's a thing in team and systems coaching called ghost roles. And it's the presence of a thing, a person or an event that isn't physically there, but is felt. So obviously grief for a loved one that's passed, we feel them around us. But in romantic relationship, it could be like the presence of a, you feel the presence of their ex or a mother-in-law, something like that, you know. Um, but in, in work, it could be a CEO that's that's left the, the previous, you know, owner of a business or something like that. But in life, it can be these events that we still feel you know, they're, they're with us, even though they're not present. And we the only way to get past that is as you would with any grief is to really honor what that was and what that meant, even if it was very, very hard. What did that mean? What do I need to do to sort of give it the how can I honor this time that I had or that I lost? What do I need to do for that 14 year old version of me? How can I love her? I'm sure you've been doing inner child. You know, how can I love that inner child and send her what she needed at that time? How can I honor that, that phase of life that wasn't, you know, and grieve for what I didn't have? And then I can put it down and then I can move past it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we get very, you know, the word depression 
if you think about it again physically i'm a very body focused sort of person and practitioner but trauma lives in your body you'll know this as well so trauma is always in your body and i've done so many sessions with clients countless where i physically see it coming out you know i see their face change i see people looking younger i see back problems go in an instant i see you know there's it's in your body all the time and i've had it done on me i know it's also true but if we think about depression we think about depressing things into our system right if you can't see if you're not on video i'm pushing down now so you know so like imagine pushing your feelings in so you're depressing things down into your system and you're continually doing that over time if you're never creating space to allow your emotions to allow that weather you're literally you're literally depressing things right down into your system so it's again i'm not being flippant or facetious but we do need to create space however someone wants to start maybe that's you give yourself 10 minutes a day put an alarm on I'm going to start a bit like going to the gym. I'm going to start by doing 10 minutes of walking a day. I'm going to start by doing 10 minutes of not managing my feelings a day. And I've got the alarm that's going to finish. So that's it. And then maybe I'll build up and then maybe I'll put in a meditation practice and you'll realize it's not so bad. Mm -hmm. You know, you'll realize it does. Emotions are the weather. So you might be sitting under a stormy sky for 10 minutes one day and the next day you'll be in absolute bliss. Yeah, I completely, completely agree. Um, there's one thing I wanted to ask you is like, um, you know, fear of rejection and fear of abandonment is quite common in our society. Yeah. Um, why do you think that's the case? Okay, so physiologically, so this is all this all goes back to sort of when we lived in community and our survival was reliant on that. So let's just say that, that you and I, we live together in our certain community. And, you know, to do that, our basic needs, our basic needs for survival have to be met. So that includes food, water, shelter, and in those days it would have been heat and fire. So that's how we're going to survive. So if I was to be ostracized from that group, if I was to be rejected from that group, I would not have my basic needs met. I, I would not be able to survive. You know, we literally have these, these roles in these groups and every day is, is a new day. You know, we need to collect berries, get some food, light a fire, you know, be together. That's how we're going to survive in these in this community, in this living. Now, our physiology, our software has not updated from those times. So we're now in 2023 and, you know, I live alone in my house and, you know, it's like I'm, I'm safe on my own. And thankfully, you know, despite fuel poverty, the heating works, <laughs> you know, all of that. So and there's delivery, you know, but yeah, I, I'm able to survive now alone. But my physiology hasn't been, as I say, updated from that time. I'm running on like an old software version, doesn't doesn't meet the hardware of, of modern living times. So when I find myself in a social situation or on stage, or I'm going to be talking about something, there is understandably my inner critic jumping in, which is what it is, it's the saboteur, imposter syndrome, the ego, negative self-talk, it, it comes by a lot of different names, the judge. And it's saying to me, oh, Annalie, oh, don't say that. Oh, no, 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 no. Let, let's, let's steer clear of that subject. That's a bit, oh, you don't want to get cancelled or, or that's a bit risky or oh, what if that person hears it or, oh no, what if, what if that doesn't land or, you know, and so my inner critic is trying to keep me safe, mm. as safe from being rejected. Now the inner critic has only got one way of doing that and that's sticking to what it knows. Mm. And what it knows is also called your comfort zone. So we have this huge fear of rejection because, again, it's it's this old, outdated software and it, it kicks in. You have these feelings of, oh, gosh, what if I'm rejected by you or by society, then I lose everything. And, and it's it's not actually true. And again, if we go back to spiritual path, we know that what is meant for us will not miss us. So but that that is the dichotomy, I think, of modern living in itself. I have this inherent software and need to be connected and we do need to be connected with quality relationships. They do enrich our lives. But there's people pleasing that then can kick in as a sort of behavior based on the back of that, because I want to be connected. I don't want to be rejected. So I must make sure that I'm meeting this person's needs to, to be liked, to be accepted, all of those things, celebrated. And then the other side of it is me wanting autonomy and to live authentically and not have a mask and feel like myself and be spiritually awakened. So again, I sort of want to say to people, if they're starting a spiritual journey, just understand that your software 
is also going through a big upgrade. You know, your software is going through this big, like long upgrade system. And there will be times, a number of times that you will be faced with your inner critic going, oh, no, 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 let's just stay as we are. Or don't go out today. Or no, don't sign up for that class. Or no one will like you. Or I know they talked about, about that, but you're different. It won't happen to you. Or, oh, no, just stay in. It's safer. Or don't don't send that email. Or don't put yourself out there. Or don't go on that dating website, whatever it might be that someone wants to do, your inner critic is always going to step in because it's desperately trying to keep you safe. Mm -hmm. And the only way it knows how is by keeping you in your comfort zone. So I always refer to it as an unskillful friend that's just got it a bit wrong. It's Mm well-intentioned. You can hear that the intentions are good. It doesn't want you to be rejected. It doesn't want you to fail. If you make a fool of yourself, you know, the things you might say to yourself, you would therefore potentially fail and then potentially you'll be rejected. And that's where all these old physiological feelings come in about survival and I won't be safe. I won't be safe. It's that feeling. And then, of course, you're going down a spiritual path, which really all of that is shedding layers. (laughs) Shedding masks, shedding layers, being authentic, speaking your truth. I mean, you and I are very spiritual, you know, block throat chakras, all of those things that you speak it into form and not fear it and then the the path will become lighter and lighter the more you do that so I just again want to want to put some I guess hold some space for the fact that that is a balancing act certainly to start with but I think when you have the education and you realize what's happening and why it's happening you can go into conversation with your inner critic and go right okay listen thank you so much I understand why you're doing this I understand that you're doing it because you don't want me to fail you don't want me to be rejected You don't want me to feel unsafe, but we've got this. And then what you can do is you can remind your inner critic of a few times that you have done this. So, you know, do you remember that time that we signed up to that thing and we did it? Or do you remember that time that we did that presentation? Or do you remember that time that we did that race or that swim that we didn't think we could do? And the more kind of evidence you give it to support the narrative that you are able to cope with change, it will lower, it will relax its hold of you and it will kind of go, okay, you're right. You know, a bit like, an, it's a bit like an overbearing parent or caregiver. It's a bit like, oh, no, no, no don't do that. Cause you might scrape your knee. No, 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 don't, 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 don't. You're like, I've done it. I'm a big girl. I'm okay. Yeah. And you know what? It reminds me of just, um, oh, oh my God. It's just, for some reason, have you heard of internal family systems? Yes, yes, yes. Right. Oh, I love that work. So um, it reminds me of your protectors where they want to be in control or, and, but your exile parts are triggered. So, for me, the wound of abandonment have been because um, I'm anxious attached as well. So it's like wound of abandonment is right there um, throughout my life. And it was only like two years ago and I really started working on it and realized that, oh, actually, it's wound of abandonment. And I was going into at that time, like I was I was in a relationship and every time I was triggered, there was an argument or something's happening and I'm feeling that uh, rush of abandonment uh, feeling coming up. I would contact my friend Natasha, who's a IFS therapist, and she's amazing. And I was like, can we do a session? Because I'm feeling like this trigger's coming up. And then she's like, okay, we're booking it. And so I'm going in. And it's so profound that um, one of the memories that was coming up was uh, when I was in my mom's room. Mm. And I've never met my dad's side of the family because apparently they were very, they weren't like, you know, they were abusive and they, they weren't, Right. You know, so um, and at that time, my mom was going uh, pregnant with me and I went in the IFS session thinking I don't belong in this world and I'm feeling like um, I'm not accepted. And when we went deeper and deeper, and deeper, it was that part um, that was actually I was seeing that part right there in front of me in a room. That was me in a room. And um and what happens like my mom, my dad's side of the family didn't accept that I was a girl. They wanted a boy. Mm. So so my mom's feeling all those emotions and it's coming. It's and now I'm taking that on because she's she's feeling that. Um and I've been living with that throughout my life. Yeah, there's the most amazing book, just again, for people listening that maybe can't afford to or hasn't got access to IFS there's an amazing book from Mark Wallin called it didn't start with you and it's about epigenetics Mm -hmm. so it's it's inherited family trauma effectively what you're talking about so this always blows 
my mind, a little biology. Again, I'm all about the body, physiology lesson. So as women, we are born with all of the eggs we will ever have. So we only lose them over time, hence the, you know, your clock's ticking and all of that. So my daughter, who's seven, has got all of the eggs she will ever have. This blows my mind. Um, <laughs> what this means is, I think it's from five months when you're in your utero, anything that happens to your mother, you take it on. Mm. So when my mother was pregnant with me, talking about abandonment wound, I definitely had that as well. My grandfather died, her father died. So and I would have been five months in utero then. So not only have I taken that on, the loss of her beloved father, because I had Amber and I had my eggs were on board at five months. My daughter's name's Amber. She's also sort of taken on a, a ripple of that. So absolutely, you naming that your mother being pregnant with you at the time and having, um, you know, being disregarded by your father's side of the family and, and it was abusive and, you know, obviously probably very scary and upsetting at the time. She's taken that on herself. You've taken it on and all of your eggs have taken it on. <laughs> so, and then if you think about the, I mean, I'm 42 in a couple of months. So my grandmother was in the war, for example. So my grandmother, who then had my mother and my auntie, they were twins, mm -hmm. uh, two females again, very shortly after that, they've taken on the trauma of being truly post-war. And then that has sort of carried on. So again, abandonment, losses, triggers, trauma, stress, it's incredible. But the beautiful thing is, again, people listening going, oh, well, brilliant, because you know I know that my poor mother struggled or again in this book it's terrific because there's all these fantastic sort of quizzes and workbook areas you can go through and that there's a lot of studies as well that show that the way to reverse this exactly as we've been talking about is your environment mm. is is ensuring that your environment is calm and safe is ensuring that you know you're however you want to do any work but you're being able to calm your nervous system I mean the book is genuinely incredible some of the stories are absolutely amazing and they do a study or he refers to a study which is about mice to sort of demonstrate the point and mice have the, the shortest gestation period I think of any animals it's like 11 days or something from being pregnant to having a baby mouse it's insane it's very very quick anyway the experimenters had a group of the first group of mice and they put a smell in I think it was like a flower and uh, and they hurt them so it's obviously not very nice but this is scientists for you and anyway they then didn't repeat that experiment at all and then there was four generations of mice so we're, we're great grandchild mousy at this point yeah and they only put the smell back in of this certain flower to where they were uh -huh. and all of those baby mice so four generations on ran from the smell <laughs> So, because they felt they were going to get hurt. Yeah. So, I mean, this is just a demonstration of the power of epigenetic and, and trauma. And IFS is a great system. I do constellation work with my client, which is very similar to IFS. We constellate, IFS constellates. But it's it's incredible when you can, and parts therapy is another wonderful oh, yeah. tool people can use. Um, but yeah, you're, the epigenetic information and that book I would really recommend it to people and it's it's you know I appreciate it's privileged to work with me or or IFS therapists so that book would be probably nothing on audible or it's actually on my I've got an Amazon bookstore it's on there if people want to check it out I know you're going to have all of my links on here but it's a very good um dive into just unpicking your own family and just having a bit more understanding and maybe even empathy you know mm -hmm. for yourself your wounds because you naming it, I you know, I have an abandonment wound. I have some struggle with it. I have anxious attachment style. You're obviously doing a lot of work on yourself and you're kind of comfortable to name it and be doing work in that place. But again, a lot of people feel shame about that. Like there's something wrong with them yeah. because they have, you know, almost like this diagnosis. And no, you know, have a look at maybe where these things came from. And I think the only cure for shame is self-compassion. And my big passion myself is leading people to that place where they can use the lens of self-compassion on perhaps why they find themselves where they are perhaps why they feel they're repeating cycles maybe why they feel that they're taking a path away from friends and needing to change and you know not knowing why and using that lens of self-compassion is the only way to move away from shame truly yeah I completely agree and I think um Doing this work is so freeing. It's so, so freeing because like for the past two years, the thing is like when you get in a mindset, it's like, I want to, I want to do this. I want to not fix it, 
there's nothing wrong with you, but I want it. I would overcome it. Mm-hmm. You determine and you get your discipline in it. And it was like, like session after session after session, a lot of crying, a lot of, but I love this kind of work because it's just the clearing and the coming in the new opportunities. It's just incredible. And, you know, I think like a, a lot of people do, like you said, do shy away from that, you know, like if you, if you have a fear um, of a, a abandonment and if you have a fear of rejection, a lot of people do it's like well I don't want to look into it because it's like it's about taking accountability as well mm. you know the, their behavior sometimes we can say yeah this is the core wound this is the core trauma but sometimes the behaviors are are are, are really bad like not bad but um what am I trying to say I know what you mean there's a bit of a yeah. tricky thing at the moment where I, I see it especially in social media where or even in real life where people go oh well I've got avoidant attachment style Right. Okay. Well, if you have the knowledge about that, great. But what responsibility are you taking to move yourself to more of a secure place? You know, what work are you doing? So terrific if you know, really helpful, like brilliant, because then that's a lens and you understand more about yourself. And if you're going into relationship, you know, you can help work with your partner on that or whatever. But if all you're doing is is using it as like an excuse, well, I've got avoidant attachment styles. That's why I cheated on you. (laughs) do something about it (laughs) where is the responsibility and I do think there's quite a lot of that in the sort of wellness healing space where people say oh it's a boundary is it or are you just being you know is it because it might be and that's great and if you're putting in a boundary you know I always say that we put in boundaries to look after and retain and hold on to relationships that we value if it's a relationship you don't value you're not going to worry about it you're not going to put any energy into it ever again you're going to let it go it doesn't matter but if it's a relationship of value to you and you want to keep it and either you need some a boundary for for energy to focus on something for you or you need a boundary because you're struggling perhaps with a dynamic in that relationship or maybe that relationship is just in a state of flux and you want to put a boundary in for a temporary period of time just to see where it settles that's okay but please be skillful with it and where you can try and explain it to the other person because that's where I think this whole oh it's a boundary is it or is it is it or are you just being you know very nice because that's not okay obviously yeah Yeah. I think uh yeah there's just so there's a lot of these sort of terms being banded around and in in therapy and in in practice there's a term called secondary gains i don't know if you've heard of that i've not heard of that no okay or your listenership so it's it's picking up on the point that you made where a second so let's just say um i've decided to follow uh a plant based diet which i'm a big fan of by the way but uh, I, i'm not fully fully there and um i so then i'm everyone i but i'm doing this for secondary gains and you'll see why in a minute so then it's like oh, no, 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 I can't go to that restaurant and I can't do this. And everyone's like, oh, no, yeah, no, no, she can't go there or she can't do this or she needs to have this or no, she can't eat that and she can't have that. I'm actually getting a lot of attention, right, that maybe I wasn't getting before. Now, let's say that I've been, and again, I'm just going to tread carefully here because obviously, you know, this isn't the case with everybody. But as a therapist, you have to check if I'm being sent somebody, let's just say somebody wants to send their child or a partner in to see me or something like that. Mm. And I need to check that they actually want to get better. I need to check that they don't want to have avoidant attachment anymore or use it as a a sort of pink slip to do what they like. Because the thing is, when you have healed or you're doing the work as, as you are, you have to take accountability and responsibility for yourself. So secondary gains is a place where actually I benefit from this condition in inverted commas. So as I say, maybe I, um, oh, I've got avoidant attachment style. So that means that I can just, I don't know, be an absolute player, be completely non-committed, you know, do whatever I want and go, oh, it's because I've got avoidant attachment style. So that's actually not my fault. You know, so I'm, that's a secondary gain. I don't need to take any accountability. I don't need to take responsibility. And actually I benefit from being, should we, should we say like, you know, in this condition or something like that. And there are some conditions, physical, mental, otherwise, where people benefit because they get extra retention. You know, some people, and again, it's often not anyone's fault, maybe it's just a dynamic. uh, Some people get more attention when they're unwell. Mm -hmm. Some people get, you know, people checking in more and calling and things like that. And then if they start to get better, everyone's like, oh, great, you're better now. 
Mm. That's brilliant. Okay, you can go back to work and you can do this and you can take on that responsibility and you can deal with the kids and da 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 da. And they're like, oh no, I preferred it when I had no responsibility, but I had all the attention. That actually felt really nice. That is secondary gains. So when wow. you're you sometimes need to check in, in the position that I'm in that somebody, like I say, if somebody's coming to me themselves, they, which is usually my clientele, they really want to do the work, they tried everything, it hasn't worked, and they they just kind of are exhausted and they really want some impactful help. And that's kind of where I really come into my own. But there are times that say someone's very gently or generously saying, oh, go and see her, she's terrific. And I know they don't want to because they're benefiting from their condition. Oh my God, that's like, it really hit home because I was in a dynamic of anxious and avoidant relationship. Obviously, anxious, always avoidant, 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 (laughs) anxious. But the good thing is I was working on my stuff. (laughs) But this is the thing, going back to taking responsibility, because what I've learned from being in the relationship itself is that when you are doing the work, you have to be with somebody who is doing the work on themselves as well. Oh, yeah. You cannot be in a relationship where the other one doesn't take accountable action. It's, it's completely one sided. And, and again, if we just simply look at energy, it doesn't match. You know, if I have an energy of improvement, whatever that looks like, you might not be doing the work in the same way that I am or you are, and it might be quite extreme doing IFS with people. But if you're, you know, doing something to, make sure that you're feeling as good as possible. That's important. You know, we describe relationship in systems. I I say systems a lot, by the way. It's it's a term for group, relationship, um, family, friends, whatever. It's a system. Anything that's a group is a system, more than one. So including romantic relationship. And in systems coaching, we are told to look at relationship as the third entity. So there's you, Mm. there's me, and then there's the relationship. Mm. So this stops codependency. But equally, both of us need to work on ourselves independently to make sure we're the best versions of ourselves as possible. Now, that might not be like the work like we're doing. It could be sports or a hobby or things just make you feel passionate and happy. Mm. And then both of you take that to the relationship, the third entity. If we were drawing a triangle, it would be the third point. And we pour into that relationship. We top it up like a bank account because, my God, life happens, right? Mm. And something will happen. So there'll be loss there'll be hardship there'll be stress there'll be strain and we need to make withdrawals from the relationship you know I've been working all week I'm exhausted so have you uh things cost of living crisis is is very real right now you know really stressed financially and really stretched like that's going to pull on the relationship um people being unwell grief loss all all manner of things are going to pull on the relationship so you both need to be making sure that you as individuals are as uh topped up your own bank account so that you're able to continually pay deposits into the relationship so that if you're making one of these withdrawals you don't go into the red you don't go into debt it doesn't hurt Mm. because I've certainly been in relationship and I'm sure that you have where that relationship has not been getting topped up because somebody else isn't working on themselves and you haven't got enough in your tank to do it for Mm. the other person and the relationship and then when when the withdrawals start happening because again hi life every single little thing hurts every tiny thing hurts you know mm-hmm. it's I, I I'm out tonight or I can't work late or I'm sorry I can't stop and pick up this thing or I can't help you there like ouch it's like death by a thousand yes. cuts because there simply isn't enough resiliency or a buffer in that relationship bank account so it's it's really painful and that's why whatever the other person's doing as I said they don't have to be like wildly spiritual so you know this in the same space that I am if I was looking for relationship but they need to be doing things that shore up their own foundations and I can see that so that they do have things to put into the third entity, that relationship bank account, because life will always happen. Because mm, I often see that um, well, from my experience has always been the external checklist that uh, this person has to be this, 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 this. But what about the internal checklist? What are yeah. you not looking at? <laughs> you know, yeah. Um, but yeah, like it's it's amazing we're having this conversation because this is like really healing for me as well you know, coming from you and doing, having a conversation with you now it kind of just kind of uh, leads me into the next question you talk about uh founding founding um founding. Yeah. um what is it because like it's something that I've not heard of before 
Okay, so yeah, it's fairly, I don't think it is new, but I must say that even in my own training circles and groups and, and things that I go to and qualifications, it's been fairly newly discussed. So fawning is a trauma response. So the ones that we tend to know about are fight, flight, and freeze. Most people know about those. And the two lesser discussed are flop and fawn. So flop is, you've seen something scary and you literally pass out on the spot. You know, sometimes you see the funny videos of like grooms at the altar for a wedding. And- <laughs> They get overwhelmed and they pass out, right? That's a lot. Yeah. And then also um, you get, say, like the little impala deers. Like, I don't know if you've ever seen that in wildlife programs where they, if they see a predator, they have a, a yeah. literal <laughs> flop. <laughs> yeah. That's flop. Fawn is something that is not being oh, as, dis- as discussed. I don't think, I don't think there's much understanding about it. I actually feel incredibly passionately about bringing this into the fore. So thank you for asking me about this because in my experience, I think people carry the most shame when they have fawned. So I will give you an example of fawning. So I, so trigger warning, I'm going to discuss sexual assault here for anyone listening that wants to turn off. Um, I work with a lot of clients that have experienced sexual assault. That is something that I specialize in. So, uh, and there has never been a client that I have worked with that has experienced sexual assault that did not in some way have shame around a moment where they may have felt that they formed. So what I mean by that is, I I need to be very careful what I say here because obviously there's like, uh, you know, protecting clients, but I have worked with people where it has very evidently been a premeditated attack that has ended up in high court. I mean, it's that level of uh, assault. And still working with that individual, they have felt shame because at one point they maybe acted like they were up for it, shall we say, went along with something or didn't fight them off at one point. Now, anyone listening, and, and I'm sure yourself and myself, I would have done the same. I would have done it. It's a predator that I am unable physically to fight off. I can't flight. I can't run. If I freeze, sort of same effect. And actually, there would be a lot of freezing happening as well. I mean, I probably would wish I could pass out and flop, but that's maybe reality. The only trauma response left is to form. And trauma works in an interesting way. So trauma is not rational or cognitive. You're not thinking, you're you're not choosing. It doesn't come up going, hey, Emily, which one do you want to choose? Oh, I'm going to go along with form, please. Mm-hmm. If I could, I would have, I would fight them. Of course I would. Or I'd have superpowers and I'd be able to run off so quickly, you know, and be able to call for help. But the reality is, the sad, desperate reality is that a lot of the time that isn't possible. So your body pre-selects a trauma response for you way quicker than cognitive thought. So in your brain, at the very front of your mind, you have your prefrontal cortex. I'm tapping on my forehead for people that are listening. And just sitting behind that is your broker's area, which is language, right? And then at the back of your sort of of back lower part of your your brain, there is your amygdala, your limbic system. It's your lizard brain, as they call it, like your prehistoric, the animal system. And again, if we go back to your physiology, this this is what fires first. So if I'm experiencing a threat, all of the blood has gone away from my prefrontal cortex and my broker's area. If you've ever heard people say, and I've had it with me with trauma, I can't remember what they said, but I remember what they did, or I remember how they smelled, or I can remember what color the blah, blah was. Like, I can't remember what they said. That's why. So the reason you can't remember what they said is because the blood's gone away from your prefrontal cortex and your broker's area. It's it's gone. We don't need it right now. We need to stay alive. So all the blood's gone into my amygdala, my limbic system, this lizard part, my prehistoric brain, because that is where the trauma responses fire from. So this is fight, flight, freeze, flop and form. Now, if I'm in a situation where I might be getting or or at risk of being assaulted, if I'm in a situation where there might be domestic violence, if I'm in a situation where... Uh, any kind of threat, even narcissistic bosses at work, but my family's survival depends on it. Or there's something where, you know, a, a parent that I am is violent or, or cruel and I, I'm too young to have autonomy. My brain fires so fast. I'm not thinking about it. This is the thing I really need people to understand. If you have ever found yourself fawning and you have shame, you did not choose it. it your body chose it for you. It was pre-selected. You could never have chosen it. I want that mm-hmm. to be really clear. So your body's gone in, it's assessed the situation. And if I go back to an assault, a sexual assault, it's, I'll put myself in this picture and it says, you, you know, my brain has gone, no chance of fighting, no chance of flight, no chance of freeze isn't going to help. Flops, you're definitely going to die if you flop. Mm -hmm. So we're going to form. 
So what I might do in that situation is I might take my clothes off quickly or I might try and pretend if I possibly could that this was something that I also wanted or just just go along with something to just hope that it might be over. And anyone I've ever spoken to has, when we've discussed this, has been like, yeah, I would have done the same. Mm. You know, if I can't get out of the situation. I would have just tried to stay alive and gone along with it. And when I could get help, I would have done. That is fawning. So what happens is, I mean, I grew up in a household with violence. My father was violent towards me. I was a child, you know, barely the same age as my daughter is now. I couldn't leave. I didn't have any autonomy. I couldn't not be a part of that family. I wish I could, you know, like I couldn't get out of there. So I still had to be nice to my persecutor, you know, Mm. I had to to try and be a good girl. Because if I was a good girl, maybe I wouldn't get beaten up that day. If I was a good girl, maybe I wouldn't get hurt. So I had to fawn and try and be nice and placate this this persecutor, this violent person, because I had no choice. So then what that can become, fawning can then present itself. If you had an experience of fawn, you tend to get left with a huge amount of shame. Like I say, like, why did I uh, allow him to kiss me? Why did I go along with that? Why did I let that happen? Because you were so afraid, because you were so afraid that your system kicked in And it selected this response for you. That's why you did it, because you were frightened, because you were so afraid and because that was the only response that would have kept you alive in this situation. Mm -hmm. So if I go back to my family setup, the way that that fawning response sort of spoke to me was that I had this male persecutor. I couldn't get out there. I had to try and fawn to not be hurt. So my young self, if I'm a good girl, I don't get pain. Now, what that looks like growing up is people pleasing and especially in in conversation, work context, any kind of conflict with a man, I would want to avoid that. So I would people please and I would present myself in a certain way and I would repress my vulnerability and I would try and fit in and, you know, not not therefore put myself into a position where I could be hurt if conflict arose. So that is what fawning is. And I just think there is not enough information at the moment and not enough people talking about it because I'm fairly sure most people at some point have formed in a situation they wish they hadn't. Like I say, a narcissistic boss. Why did I go along with them asking me to do that and say that about my coworker? Mm. Why did I, a nurse, you know, a friend or someone that had more power or, you know, a dynamic or a, you know, you had to have carers helping you with your parents when you were so young. I'm sure, I'm sure you've had to form plenty of times because you didn't have a choice. You didn't have autonomy, no. you know, relationships that don't serve us. But we're, we're, and like I say, domestic violence in particular, you know, well, if I fawn and pretend, then maybe he won't hit my children, mm. you know? So but we end up with the shame. Why did you stay for so long? Why mm. did you stay? because I was so terrified that I selected these responses. And sometimes it's like, it plays out as like, oh, I'm um, deep core of like, I'm deserving, I deserve it. Yeah, because you formed, this is it, because at some point your system pre-selected this response and you said or did something that came out of your mouth that doesn't seem in line with the event. Like I say, someone could hit you in a in a violent relationship and you could still find yourself kissing them. Mm-hmm. Like in Emily Nagowski's book, Come As You Are, which is exceptional, anyone that has, I'm sorry if they have experienced any kind of sexual assault or what I'm saying is interesting. She is a, um, a lecturer and educator in the States and it's an incredible book. And she talks about how there's research that suggests that victims of domestic violence often report having exceptional sex sex lives mm-hmm. now how confusing and shameful is that I mean how can I have an experience where this person is physically harming me and frightening me and yet have pleasure sexual pleasure mm-hmm. the shame of that the answer is because you were put into form because actually by having this response is keeping you safe there's also more uh, physiological information about that which is again going back to being attached and being safer in numbers and because the relationship is unsafe it's a violent relationship we all have to be in balance so it turns up the dial of sexual attraction and chemistry to keep you bound to this person because again we're safer in numbers so that book is exceptional if, if this is resonating with anybody but the shame we feel because at some point well I must have been asking for it mm. I, I had a drink well I did kiss him first mm. well, you know, like the gray area in inverted commas, it's never a gray area. Mm. For anyone listening to this that doesn't have access to a therapist, please, that book is exceptional. And the second thing I would say is, this is how I work with all clients in this space that somehow feels it was their fault. I ask them to put their best friend or someone of the same age, maybe a niece or a nephew or a 
friend's child or someone that you know into that scenario mm -hmm. you know put them in that bed or put them in that situation and you tell me if it was their fault if in any way shape or form it was their fault yeah so it's often also just just to like not the extreme violence but it could be just emotional abuse coming in a relationship so, yeah and why did I then make him dinner I'm, I'm, I'm using yeah. him and I'm, I'm yeah. sort of talking in this yeah. in this context but yeah and then why did I he did that to me and then why did I continue in he that he said that to me he did yeah, yeah yeah but yet I still did this yeah. that's why yeah. and I just don't I think people are trapped in relationships because of shame actually mm. yeah it's the shame yeah. from morning yeah um I know I'm I'm just conscious about the time at the moment um I actually do have rapid fire questions which I really want right. to go through but before then I just want to ask you really quickly um now you're a parent right and yeah. I know I don't have a parent I'm not I'm not I don't have a parent I don't have a child uh but I do work in schools and many of my friends and listeners have kids I heard, um, have you heard of Gabby Bernstein? Yeah. Um, yeah, she's amazing. She's, she was, I was listening to her, uh, one of her podcasts and she said like, it's so important to do your work, um, work before you have kids. Like, mm. why do you think that is? So I mean, literally as we were talking about sort of epigenetics and, you know, as, as you all know, like not being the, the sort of, uh, black uh, like whores the family or however they call it like just sort of not cheap. Being, like, <laughs> actually, that's it. I see yeah. what it was then yeah you know like uh, being just not carrying it on basically you know as a parent you've got to take responsibility like my daughter is nearly seven she's a child and I want to give her that childhood I'm a grown-up I need I'm the one that gets to choose I am at choice how I react uh, you know, don't get me wrong, I'm not perfect. And there are sometimes hormones, you know, certain times of the month and those sorts of things where I might be a bit more ratty or tired and things like that. But I'm still a grown up. Mm. And I find it so abhorrent, a strong word, but kind of when people are not taking responsibility or accountability for themselves, and they're pushing mm. it to sort of future generations. And like I say, I'm not perfect. I've certainly, you know, there's no one that's going to get through it without any kind of things to unpack for themselves. But I just think it's really important that I know how to find my center and I know when it's my stuff. I say sorry to her when I'm wrong. And that's, you know, if I've got it wrong, I say sorry to her. I'm, I'm not sort of, you know, my way or the highway. And uh, I just really try and make sure she doesn't take on shame when she is being herself, you know, when mm. she's expressing her authenticity. I just try and make sure there's no point that she is. And, you know, you're a woman as well. I never, ever want her to feel like she's too much or you know anything like that that I've carried I think a lot of us have um I want her to feel real joy in in being herself so yeah I think it's really imp and look again there's never a day that you're not doing the work there's never a day there's not something to learn there's never a day yeah. I have picked up a book and gone oh shit well I did that <laughs> You know, like, I wish I knew that now. Yeah, well, Marte, now I've read all of his books. Yeah, oh, well, he's amazing. Yeah, he's incredible. But, you know, I didn't read them before I had my daughter. So, you know, there's, there's certainly a few, dare I call them mistakes? I'm not going to say that. But I'm working every day on me, and that gets passed on to her. And the other thing I would say is for people who have got, you know, I'm a single parent as well, and I've done it on lockdown and all sorts and divorce, and it's not, it's really not been easy. But I read something the other day, and it really resonated, and it was that you won't be their whole world for that long you know like she wants to get into bed with me a lot wake me up in the night and you could be like oh god she's not going to want to do that forever <laughs> I'm not saying it's right and there's all these different parenting schools of thought but I'm not going to be her whole world forever and um my job is to help her become the person that she she needs to be and support her on that journey that's my job and obviously keep her as safe as possible but yeah it's, uh, it's she, I guess I guess she sees you um like working on on yourself she'll automatically take that on and do it do the work on herself as well whatever stuff comes up for her as well you know in the, in the future things are very safe for us to talk about it's always very safe for her to talk to me about anything and I never make her wrong and even if sometimes a bit like <gasps> you know like a boy wants to kiss her at school and I'm like oh <laughs> You know, but it's like at that age, it's yeah. like, you know, like a little, but even so I'm, I'm kind of, you know, my systems are firing about it, but I just yeah. try to make it so that we have a, we have an open conversation and that oh. there's no shame. There's never any shame. Amazing. Amazing. Um, okay. Let's get into the fire, uh, fire, rapid fire questions. <laughs> I'm so excited. So what is your definition of God universal life? Uh, I'm very spiritual so I would say the universe and uh, yeah like source or flow and kind of being in flow but yeah for me um, I just try and live a really good life 
I go to bed every night and I sleep really well because I have a clear conscience and that makes the softest pillow. So for me, that's just how I choose to live my life is just uh, being honest um, and being true to me and in turn being, you know, trying to do something good for others. It's just, that's just who I am. Beautiful. Uh, what do you think happens when you die? Ooh, well, I have listened to many lives, many masters. So but if you've not listened to it, please do. It's extraordinary. I think that your soul is um, often around for, for longer than one go around the sun. So I think that we're often in a soul system and a soul family. And um, I think you can tell the younger souls from the older souls. So yes, I think. Beautiful. Souls. Me too. Um, how do you define religion and spirituality? Mm, interesting. I think just anything. So I'm, I think I look at that more of a lens with purpose and it's whatever gives you, you know, purpose is defined as a cause greater than yourself mm. and a connection to that community. So I think whether it's religion, spirituality, a mix of both, something else, I think that that is uh, something that usually is an, an energy or a fundamental that serves your purpose. Oh, fantastic. What was the lesson that took you the longest to learn? <laughs> that being vulnerable truly is my greatest strength. Oh, yes. Yes, I love it. I love it. Okay. Do you believe that people with horrible beginnings end up creating the best futures? If I look at myself, I'd say yes. I just, I'd like to say that I, be I don't believe that anything is impossible. Beautiful. You got all the answers that I, I normally give us also. It's fantastic. Okay, so um, I'm fully in present moment when? Ooh, laughing. Like I've, I've yeah. got quite mischievous. I'm quite mischievous. I really like that about myself. <laughs> I, uh, it's, you know, it's a nice, fun energy and quite, I'm, I'm a joyful soul. So yeah, when it's like, you know, that kind of proper just laughing and just, just being in joy, I would yeah. say. Beautiful. Do you... Do you believe there is an end to healing? No, sorry. <laughs> it will uh, continue until laugh time we come back again. Yeah, and I think as soon as you accept that and you see that as a beautiful journey, I what I'm going to say, though, to caveat that is I do think that there is a place where you find peace and that becomes more um more of your life so mm -hmm. although they, the path of healing may never end and people again might be feeling overwhelmed by oh god well I'm feeling really low and I don't I don't have the energy to keep going forever you will because by continuing on the path of healing your day-to-day -day life becomes so much more full of peace oh beautiful um the world needs more or what healers yes. Yes, yes 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 bring it on uh one last question so if there is someone who's going through their spiritual awakening, adversity, dark night, the soul, and they can't see the light at the end of the tunnel, what would you say to them? I would say go back to what you did when you were young and have a look at sort of what made you feel alive then and find a way to bring even slivers of that into your daily life now. Because what tended to be the thing that you love then will be sort of what you're on this this earth for and will be in the future so try and reconnect it doesn't have to be like full in a child but just try and reconnect to something that gives you that light and makes you feel alive and uh, hold on to that beautiful beautiful um so how can people contact you so the best way probably to get hold of me are the one that we're connected through most people know me for is my instagram which is at annalee howling and i put out a lot of it's all free you know there's lots of reels and tips and advice and book recommendations and all stuff i've got a tiktok which is also at annalee howling we're launching youtube very shortly which is going to be deeper dive explanations trauma responses fawning people pleasing friendships boundaries you name it and chucking it all out on there mm -hmm. and then my website www.annaliehowling.com and there's resources on there so you can buy like a self-study guide which will take you through in really great detail there's courses you can sign up for there's a master class where you get to meet your inner critic and uh, stop the negative self-talk so yeah that's the best way to get hold of me but we answer like it's myself and I've got someone that I work with but we answer every message on Instagram so if someone listens to this and they want to ask a question ask me we'll answer it amazing amazing oh thank you so much Annalie for coming on uh, this podcast I'm sure there's many of our listeners will be um, taking so much wisdom and knowledge from you thank, thank you, you so much. I really appreciate you uh, having me on here today thank you 
Thank you for listening to this episode. I would absolutely love to know what your biggest takeaway from this conversation has been. You can share your thoughts on my Facebook or Instagram, Madhya Sosen. If you would like to listen to this episode, I am on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and many, many more. Just search Soul Awakenings with Madhya Sosen. If you enjoyed this episode, then please do rate and share this with your family and friends as that will help me out a lot. Thank you so much once again and I will see you in the next episode.